Civil nuclear power is often sold as the good type of nuclear, that it's both clean and safe. Basically, we're just using a new heat source. And that it's got absolutely nothing to do with nuclear weapons. Atomic energy is released safely and under complete control. But the closer you look, these two things are much more connected than you might think. And it's making me question everything. Iran's key nuclear enrichment facilities have been completely and totally obliterated. Atom bomb, hydrogen bomb, Russia claimed them too. Into that great world arena, the United Nations stepped the President of the United States to recommend harnessing of atomic materials for peaceful purposes. This is President Eisenhower unveiling his Atoms for Peace speech to the world in 1953. It is not enough to take this weapon out of the hands of the soldiers. It must be put into the hands of those who will know how to strip its military casing and adapt it to the arts of peace. Eisenhower spoke of a new dawn for nuclear technology, moving away from the mutually assured destruction from nuclear weapons and towards a peaceful future of cheap nuclear energy for all. As part of this program, the US approved the Shah of Iran on a plan to build 23 civil nuclear power stations and exported highly enriched uranium to the country. The idea was to make it possible for Iran to export electricity to its neighboring countries and achieve the status of a modern state. So this push for civil nuclear energy, instigated by the US, was the very beginning of Iran's nuclear program. Since the fall of the Shah following the Islamic Revolution, mastering civil nuclear power has become a central part of Iranian independence. Not just because it provides an alternative energy resource, but also because it demands attention and respect for Iran on the world stage. And the more Iran has developed its nuclear energy technology and enriched uranium, the more attention and scrutiny it has received internationally. Israel has launched what it calls a preemptive strike on Iran's nuclear facilities and other military targets. This is because the process of enriching uranium to make civil nuclear energy is broadly the same as for making a nuclear bomb. It is generally accepted that uranium enriched to 3.67% is sufficient for civil nuclear energy, while purity levels of 90% are required for a nuclear weapon. Once purity levels reach 60%, as in the case of Iran currently, it is not a lengthy process to proceed to 90%. However, Iran has always maintained it is not seeking to build a nuclear weapon, and its supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, has twice issued a fatwa against this perceived goal, declaring it to be un-Islamic. But there is clear precedent for acquiring military nuclear capabilities through civil nuclear programs. Pakistan, Israel, and South Africa also received highly enriched uranium from the US as part of Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace program and all three went on to develop nuclear weapons in secret. And in a way, it's unsurprising, because they were following a well-trodden route, from civil nuclear power to nuclear weapons, one which had been set quite intentionally by the officially recognized nuclear weapon states. Electricity generated entirely from nuclear fission. Never before has power from nuclear energy been produced on an industrial scale. The atom for peace, as the Queen says, Queen Elizabeth II opened the world's first commercial nuclear power station, called a hall, in Cumbria, northwest England, in 1956. And in her speech, she echoed Eisenhower's message of atoms for peace and cheap energy for all. We led the way in demonstrating the peaceful uses of this new source of power. But the atoms at Calder Hall plant, which was later known as Sellafield, were anything but peaceful. Calder Hall was not just a civil nuclear power station. It was built primarily to produce weapons-grade plutonium for the UK's nuclear weapons program. The electricity it produced was merely a byproduct. This established an intrinsic link between the UK's civil nuclear industry and the production and operation of the nation's military nuclear weapons and facilities, a link that pervades to this day. This is Sellafield, the most controversial nuclear plant in the world. A 2005 study for the Ministry of Defence suggested that the industrial base for nuclear submarines was at risk of deterioration if not carefully managed and could lead to the erosion of defence system production skills. This reportedly prompted the then Prime Minister Tony Blair to ignore his own government's recommendations 
and commit to new nuclear power investment. The following year, a report written by a BAE Systems executive urged the government to authorise funding and ensure the necessary industrial capacity and skills are retained for national defence. This was backed up by an MOD report in 2014. And more recently, in 2017, evidence submitted to a Parliamentary Public Accounts Committee alleged that the government is using the multi-billion pound nuclear power project, Hinkley Point C, to subsidise Trident, Britain's nuclear weapon system. Research suggests that the overall excess costs to the UK economy is estimated to be more than £5 billion per year. And this link with its civil nuclear industry is also true of the other nuclear weapon armed states who are trying to maintain expensive nuclear military infrastructure. The US is very open about the fact that its civilian nuclear industry supports what it calls the entire US nuclear enterprise and US nuclear leadership abroad. And China is also known to use civilian nuclear technology for military purposes. French President Emmanuel Macron set it out in clear terms, saying that without civil nuclear power, no military nuclear power. And in Russia, Rosatom, the state-run atomic energy corporation, is explicitly instructed to work together with the Ministry of Defense on maintaining Russia's nuclear deterrence. Not all civil nuclear programs have a military dimension. Indeed, there are many countries without nuclear weapons that use nuclear energy as a cheaper, low-carbon alternative to fossil fuels. But for nuclear-armed countries, their commitment to civil nuclear power is not solely to do with energy policy. It is often used to subsidise and maintain the industrial and skills base necessary for their military capabilities. The government has given the go-ahead to a new nuclear power station. The Energy Secretary said that the investment of more than £14 billion would bring in a new golden age of nuclear.